Hello, everybody. <laughs> this is what I wanted to show you. This is what happens when you are teaching kids high frequency sight words, but they don't have a sound symbol decoding approach. Guess what happens to all of that information that you're pouring into their brain? It just gets through like a sieve. Now some kids, it will stick, right? But a lot of kids, it you show them the, the word from, you show them the word here, and it doesn't stick, right? Does, do you experience this much? Welcome, you guys. Uh, here we go. I, we are at Reading Simplified. I'm Marnie Ginsberg, and I'm so excited that you're here. I want to share with you the number one way to help your kids learn the sight words and so that you are not pouring in instructional time like this that doesn't stick. First of all, I want to know if you are in a school setting where your first year students or kindergarten students are required to know a certain number of high frequency words or, or sight words. The number keeps going up in the last five to ten years. Sometimes I hear numbers that boggle my mind. Let me know, even if you're not a kindergarten teacher, do you know what your kindergarten or first year students are expected to have by the end of the year? Let everyone know. Share that information with us, okay? That'll be great. I'm so glad to see so many folks here. Hi, Evelyn and Sherry, Karen, Zyboon, Jennifer, and Melody from San Antonio. Love my Texas friends. Diane, welcome. And Melissa from South Georgia. Okay, awesome. So um, let me know, what are those um, kindergarten expectations? I remember when I was starting out, um, it was, as a teacher, it was like 20, 25 kinder, uh, kindergartners, words that kindergartners needed to know. Hi, Dorita. Let me know how many your kindergarten students this year are expected to know. First year students, whether you're not, whether you're a kindergarten teacher or not, you probably know that. Or if you're a first grade teacher, you can do for your students is not expect them to memorize words when they have, um, a missing piece in their brain, so to speak. They haven't yet figured out how sound symbol decoding works. In other words, there's a lot of gaps in the way they perceive the code. And what we want, of course, instead is for them to have a strong foundation. And so when you give them instruction, that information sticks, right? This is what we want. We want it to not slip through the cracks. So I'm going to show you that today, how that can happen. Okay. So the main point that might be um, surprising and or maybe disappointing, maybe you want me to show you something um, flashy and gimmicky that will help your kids soak up those sight words. But what I have to, to tell you um, is that the important thing that makes the sight words stick is the groundwork, the foundation. And that foundation has to be strong sound symbol decoding. In other words, when they see the word sun, they need to think in terms of sounds, s, uh, n, and then they need to recognize those letters that make up the word sun. They need to have sound and symbol match. They need to have the processing that works that way. Now, let me tell you, this is not something that I made up. This, hey, Curleen, this is not something I made up. This has the most profound reading research backing behind it. Um, the, the amount of research that we have on the importance of sound-based decoding for becoming a good reader is really um, mind-boggling. Um, if you were to read Why Our Children Can't Read and what we can do about it from the 90s, you would see lots of citations on that point. Or maybe you got this document, Preventing Reading Difficulties in Young Children in 98. That was from the National Research Council. They continue to find that. Um, how many of you have read the National Reading Panel Report in the U.S.? This was around 2000. Again, uh, leading researchers found um, the importance of sound symbol decoding for becoming a successful readers. Another panel did it, Developing Early Literacy. This was like 2008, the National Early Literacy Panel. Again, sounds and symbols as the basis for becoming a good reader is important. 
Um, don't forget Keith Stanovich, one of the most influential reading researchers. This whole book really documents the importance of that. And this one just came out this year, Language at the Speed of Sight, How We Read, Why So Many Can't, and What We Can Do About It. And they all say over and over again, good readers understand how the code works. They have a sound symbol approach to attacking unknown words. Poor readers don't. Poor readers have more of a visual approach to learning. Hi, Mary. Glad you're here. Another Texas friend. So what is a visual approach? Let me, let me quiz you guys, okay? So let's say I'm trying to teach you this word, okay? This is going to be the word from. Now, can you memorize it? Oh, Curleen, that's a good idea. I can do that. Yeah, I'll list these books and authors later on. I'll put that in the comments. Thank you. Okay, this is the word from. Are you going to memorize it? What are your cues? Well, it's there's not a lot to go on, right? Because these symbols don't relate to anything that you know in terms of sounds. You're probably really good at sound symbol matching, but this doesn't have a sound symbol matching base, so you have to rely only on visual information, okay? So have you got it memorized yet? Has everybody got it memorized? The word from? Oh, Melody just finished that book. Awesome. Was it this one? Great. That's a that's dense at the beginning, but at the end it really starts to pick up. Okay, are you ready? Do you think you are ready to recognize that word? Yes, Melody. It's so eye-opening. Do you think you're going to recognize? What is this word, everybody? Is this the same word? Is this from? Well, let's see. Is this the same? Actually, it's not. It's slightly different. How are you going to memorize that? How are you going to memorize that without a sound symbol connection? It's super duper hard, right? So when we are teaching here and from and is and was and we're not ensuring that our kids first have a strong sound symbol decoding basis, we are giving them information that is super hard for them to connect with. It's just slipping through the cracks, okay? Let me um, encourage you to test me on this. Maybe you don't believe me. I want you to ask um, I want you to go to two of your best readers, your strongest readers, and two of your weakest readers, and then ask them to read some nonsense words. For instance, like this, okay? Just give them this word and see if they can attack it and figure out what it is. Now, the reason we do a nonsense word in this case is because it's a little quiz to see how their underlying sound symbol processing is functioning. And if, if you have... Um, really good first grade, second, third, and up readers who can't read this, then that's kind of surprising, but it does happen. There are exceptions to every generalization, but most of your really good readers will be able to read this, or they'll be able to read this, right? This is frimp, and this is glaunt. But if they can't read that, they probably lack a strong sound symbol foundation. They don't see how the code works. And you can fix that and you can emphasize that. So um, that is really the main point that I want you to take home today. The first step in teaching high frequency sight words is not to pay attention to the visual, is not to do a lot of kinesthetic things, although those are nice. The first step in making sure that your kids have strong ability to memorize high frequency sight words is to make sure that they've built the foundation of strong sound symbol decoding. Because when they have that and they understand how the code works, how the word sun is uh, mm, and the word stomp is st, uh, mm, p, and that they rec hear the sounds and they know how each of those sounds maps on to those particular letters, when they have that processing ability, then high frequency words will start to stick because they have something to hook it on. So when I see the word, let's see, and I see this word, that's the word help. When I see it, I have four hooks, mental hooks. I can go, eh, oh, I have a lot of information. So when I am trying to learn it, I have um, visual and auditory and if I write it, I just have and speak it. I have kinesthetic. I have all those cues working for me to hook everything into in my brain. And you may say, "Oh, well, yeah, but that's somewhat decodable." What about a word that's not easily decodable? Somebody was just asking me about this word. 
Um, okay, could. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, Wendy. So glad you're here, Mindy. I was curious earlier on if you are a first grade or a kindergarten, rather kindergarten or first year teacher, if your kids are expected to have a certain number of high frequency or sight words memorized. Let me know. I'd love to hear that from you guys. Okay, so you might see this word could, and you would say, well, see, that's hard to memorize because it doesn't, it's got this funny uh. And you're right, it is funny, but there is still quite a lot of information that the brain can hook this on. This is k, this is always k, or almost always k. This is d, it's almost always d. That, the beginning and the end of the word, is very predictable. And then you can point out, well, this is u, uh, k, uh, could. It's unusual, but actually we see it that way in a couple words. We see it that way in um, should and would. And it's not that common, but it does pop up in these words. And so there is, even with the strange spellings that we have to learn, there is almost always some sound symbol combination. So we, that's how the child's brain is able to hook that information with the sounds and the symbols connected. Now you may be emphasizing that this is sh, uh, d, but then are they processing it that way? You don't know unless you are checking every now and then to see how they read a nonsense word. You don't need to teach a lot of nonsense words, but just as a quick assessment, do they see something like frimp and do they know to put the sounds together frimp like that? And if they do, then the information that you're giving them for high frequency words will more likely stick. Some kids it'll stick faster than others because there's differences in visual memory ability. But the main thing that has to be laid is that foundation so that when you um, are teaching them should, that they, they know that there's a hook. They have that hook in their mind between the sounds and the symbols. Okay, so Alexis has her has to have her first graders just know the first um, hundred fry words. So that's that's actually okay. That's not too wacky. I've heard some more wacky numbers, so that's good. That's somewhat reasonable. And Mindy says eighty-eight words for kindergarten. Yeah, that is a big number. Why is this a problem? Um, eighty-eight ne isn't necess inherently a problem. What becomes a problem is when we lead with our high frequency sight words. When we haven't ensured that our ha kids have that strong foundation, maybe what we're feeding them is just slipping through the cracks. We're not sure that they process words with a sound-based approach. When they see something like this, they might just be as hapless as if they saw the word glass or plant. Um, because they don't have that system functioning. So that is why um, a lot of our kids are stumbling, sometimes in kindergarten, first grade, but a lot of them stumble later because maybe their brain can memorize something that's mostly visual like this. Maybe they can do that for a while, but at 100 or 200 or 3,000 words, everybody's brain taps out unless you have sound symbol connections that are at the base of your decoding. And then things start to stick. Nothing, very little escapes. 25, um, Alexis says 25 a quarter. Yep, that's fairly reasonable for first grade. So I encourage you, particularly if you work with K2 kids, to not lead with high frequency sight words. Don't put your energy in here until you know that your kids have a strong sound symbol decoding base. And like I said, you can check that with a few nonsense words. I have a link up above for, I believe it's, if it's there, for some tests that are free. You can also make them up just to kind of give you a sense. It, again, if you test the kids who are strong readers, strong spellers, they'll be able to read these words. If you test the kids who are struggling, who this just doesn't seem to stick, they're going to do a poor job of this, or at least they're going to do it really slowly. So then what do we do to make sure that they've got that strong sound symbol decoding base? Well, those of you who have been connecting with me for a while, you are going to know maybe what I'm going to say next. There are two key activities that will solve this problem and give your kids that foundation. So that information about high frequency sight words won't slip past, it'll stick, okay? The two activities 
I've already got them up here on the board. One of them is switch it and read it, right? Lexus guessed it, absolutely, okay? So switch it is so important. It turns um, brains who want to use a visual-only approach into kids, into brains that use the sound symbol approach really quickly. It can happen almost in a day, in a week. Um, so it's super fast. And here's how you do it. Notice how it's going to teach how the code works, how sounds and symbols relate. This is how you lay the foundation so that you don't give them information about the code that just slips on past. Okay, so let's see. We're gonna do the word, lost my list. We'll just have to make it, okay. Let's do the word mint. Little boys, little girls, I would like you to build the word mint for me, okay? Okay, okay teacher, I'm gonna build the word mint. Mmm, it, mmm. So I, if I was already able to do that, that's pretty good because I can segment and I recognize this. But now the harder part is to do the switch. This is really going to force my brain to do some heavy lifting so that I would build that strong sound symbol decoding base. Okay, so you have mint. I would like you, like I love the mint cookies that my mom makes. Let's switch this to mist. It's raining and there's a light mist outside, little droplets of water. So we have mint. Let's switch it to mist. All right, we're going to switch that. Dorita says, as a tutor, it's difficult because they come every week with a new list of sight words, and I am just giving them the foundations with Switch and Rita. It's very frustrating, Dorita. That's why I'm trying to push back against this um, behemoth that is telling us, let's do in the first semester or the first quarter of kindergarten, let's have these sight words memorized. When we lead with sight words and we haven't ensured the foundation is laid, we are just shooting our kids in the foot. Again, some kids can get by, and they can get by for a while, but they won't get by forever. And me, as a reading tutor, when I get kids in second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth grade, many middle school and high school kids, they can't do these activities, and that's why they're struggling, because they were trying to memorize everything with a visual, mostly, approach. Maybe they know some of the beginning and the ends are based on sounds, but the rest of it's muddy, and so it's hard. Um, Okay, and Alexa says her kids love switching and they play it during recess. That is gorgeous. Okay, so this kid has mint and she needs to switch it to mist. So the child has to figure out, oh, this is the sound that I'm going to take out. And, which, and then what sound goes there to make mist? She has to hear the sound, so she's processing sound. She has to recognize the symbol, so she is matching sound and symbol over and over again as we do this activity. Okay, you got the word miss. Nicely done. Now let's switch it to must. I must teach my kids sounds of decoding. Okay, so you have missed. What are you gonna switch to make it into must? Okay, I'm going to get rid of this little overlay and this. We'll keep going. Okay, um, maybe they do this. Maybe they just take this away. And you say, oh, well, actually, we need the mm to make must. Remember, we have missed, and we need to switch it to must. So why are long and exaggerating? Makes it clear where the visual information is. It just gives her another clue. Okay, so which sound needs to go here to make must? Ah, uh, that's right. And which one of these is ah? Uh? There it is. Pull it down and say, uh. So then she switches it to, uh, st. So I'm just going to keep going and show you how you would switch every position of the word. Then switch it to dust. And then switch it to dusk. So we've switched every position of the word. We've switched the vowels in and out. And this is tuning the brain into understanding how sounds and symbols match. This is really just like push-ups and sit-ups for the brain as far as reading. This will solve so many things, so many problems for your kids. If they can't remember should and could and from and were, the first step is not to show them those words over and over again, to have them write it, to do it in Play-Doh, to write it in sand. All of those things are fine and have their place after the kids have a sound symbol approach to decoding unfamiliar words. Okay, so that was switch it really fast. Are you ready for read it? This is the second and 
Also a really important element. So we're just going to pretend that we've got our switch it board on the left and over here we're going to do the activity read it. So read it is just like it sounds. You um, sit, you ask the student to read a word. So if they're at the beginning stage, they might read a word like this. Okay? So let me help you put that word together. Maybe it's a little hard for you to see. Okay. Okay, let's put those sounds together. You've got, mm, what do you have? First, put the first sound in there. Mm, what's next? Everybody help me sing it, say it. Ma. Right. Do you hear a word? Ma. And that's how they put the sounds together. That is them building a left to right blend as you read strategy or continuous blending. That is the approach that you want them to have as they attack unfamiliar words. So they do that. Ma. They first read it. And then on their own, they get to write it. Mm, and they segment. Ah. Uh, and what word did you build? You built the word mop. That's it for read it. And then actually you can do a second part as you um, erase those sounds. I want you to say each sound again. So they're getting a second wave of phonemic segmentation and letter sound practice. Mm, ah, pa. Mm, ah, pa. And if that's easy, then you go up to the next level, like CBCC. Okay, what is that word? Let's put the first couple sounds together. What do you have? He, and they hold the e. He, oh, help. And what do they do after that? They read the word help. They just did that. And now they write it and they say the sound, connecting sounds and symbols, just like we did over here with switch it. Ha, e, oh, and then they erase it. Ha, e, Oh, so throughout both of these activities, from beginning to end, um, they are connecting sounds and symbols in everything they do. And then when they're composing in your class or in writer's workshop, encourage them to access the sounds that they hear in the words and to say them as they write them, just like we did here with help. So switch it and read it together will establish that firm foundation that gives your kids the ability to know how the code works, and then the information that you teach them when you are showing them high frequency sight words, it will start to stick. Because it has something to stick to. It has the sounds and symbols to connect to. It's not just a visual only cue. This is really hard to memorize, right? And could you detect pretty, very quickly how this was different than this? Do I have it backwards? <laughs> What's the difference? These are so similar. There's one little switch. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Diane. So the next thing, so that's that's the main lesson. Lead with high lead, lead not with high frequency sight words. Lead with sound symbol decoding through activities like switch it and read it. Then the second thing you gotta do is have them do the blend as you read approach with the reading material that they do. So for instance, if this student was practicing, this group of students was practicing short vowel words, this would have a lot, lot of nice little things for them to practice. The cat has a kit and the kit is on my lap. My lap stays warm until the kit jumps off. So there's a lot of sound symbol decoding to practice here. How does this relate to high frequency sight words? Well, when you're doing a small group reading instruction or guided reading instruction, or you're working one-on-one, -on -one, you coach your students to read words like this, in, in text like this, using that blend as you read approach. So if they come to cat and they can't read it, we, let's just tackle that first sound. What do you hear next? Okay, put it together. Uh, what is it? Oh, cat. And it's even harder for jumps. Okay, let's put the first two sounds together in jumps. Uh, what do you have? Uh, hold it. Jump. Jump. So you coach them through that text the first time. And if it's too hard for them to read the whole thing, then you buddy read and read parts of it. But then the sight word magic comes in when they read this over again and over again and over again. 
because after you they've worked hard at it, they've decoded it, they have made the connections to sound symbols with their, the way they attack this. Now you can read it to them once or twice with them following along with their finger in their eyes. The cat has a kit and the kit is on my lap. Read it over to them one or two times and then have them go practice it with a partner, with a teaching assistant, with a volunteer, with a recording. Um, or with a more advanced reader. They practice it and they practice it and they practice it. Maybe they take it home and then they come back tomorrow and for guided reading with you in your in the session, they can read this pretty well. Right, Simone? Thank you. And if they can read this pretty well, guess what some words they have begun to, to, to learn? They're going to know the. They're going to know has. They're going to know and maybe off. Now each kid will know some words slightly differently, but if they practice a text like this every day with the basis of understanding how the sounds and symbols work, then those words will start to stick. Now a lot of times what we're asked to do is send them home with a text where they don't know how sounds and symbols mix and match, or just match I should say. So that's like we're sending them home and they read it and they read it and they practice and they practice. Maybe they have it memorized. They don't even need to look at it to read it. But when you ask them to, to take a word like from that was in the text and read it in another text, they have no clue. Has that happened to you or what? It happens all the time if the kid doesn't have that strong sound symbol base. So um, Alexis says, where is that page located? This is part of the, uh, the Reading Simplified Academy in the guided reading section under short vowels. Hi Fatima and Wendy. Thanks Wendy. Okay, so sight words will stick when you start with a strong foundation of decoding, mainly using two key activities, switch it and read it, and then you coach them to use the read it approach, which we call blend as you read, during their reading time with you and then they read it over and over and over again. So repetition is absolutely important that we know that. We, um, we create these activities where they see it over and over again, but seeing it over and over again before the foundation is laid is, is like this. There's just stuff doesn't stick, all right? So that's the order that I recommend. Um, the first step, in getting sight words to stick is to ensure that your students have a sound symbol approach to decoding. You can do that with switch it and read it. I have links to those activities above with some freebies and videos on how to do them. And you encourage them to read new text that is challenging and they practice their blend as you read approach. Let's see that read, blend as you read approach again. Okay. Let's put those first two sounds together. Fr what do you have? Frog. Oh, frog. They practice that blend as you read when they're reading their new text, and then they reread it and reread it, and make sure they're doing it accurately. So you may need to step in. You may need um, audio. May need um, you know to record it on a device so that they hear you and they look at it. Um, they may need to read it with a fifth grader. They may need to read it with a teaching assistant. They may need to um, show you at the end of the day that they've mastered it. Um, some way of having them be accountable is, of course, important because things will slip through the cracks. But you won't have as many things slipping through the cracks when you build that strong foundation. Okay, so this is the kind of information that we teach that saves you time that we teach inside the Reading Simplified Academy. And so if you haven't heard about that, or you don't, um, you don't know about it, I want you to consider that you might save yourself a lot of time and your students a lot of time if you were to join us inside there. So this is what the Reading Simplified Academy looks like. And I teach you inside there about Switch It, which we just talked about, and Read It, which we also just talked about, and Guided Reading, how to take that information that, um, or that approach to, from a, of a sound symbol approach to attacking unfamiliar words and put it into play with a text that makes the difference and then how to do rereading. And these are the things that I just kind of rolled up into a ball right here. All of that, all into one, it really lays the foundation for the sight words to stick. 
Now, absolutely, some kids will still have trouble with sight word sticking, but first, don't do anything until you're sure they have a strong sound symbol decoding approach. Then you can worry about coming in with apps, more multi-sensory instruction, having them write it. Those kinds of things are certainly very useful, but don't do it first, and don't do it without the foundation. So we have this academy that teaches you these approaches and uh, it, with a handful of activities. It doesn't actually take thousands or hundreds of activities. This is it. Another one that's really important is sort it, and that's for the long vowels. Write it is kind of similar to what we did here, but without seeing the word. And then I also coach you on how to differentiate it. In other words, this, you know, I've got 27 kids. How do I meet all of their needs? I coach you to figure out ways to group those kids and um, and then extend the learning so that not only when you're grouping them for guided reading are they going to have their needs met, but when they go out into literacy centers, they will also have their needs met. So all of this, all of this information is inside the Reading Simplified Academy along with a teacher's lounge where I answer questions. Uh, it's like a discussion board and along with lots and lots of reading materials, literally hundreds of pages for kindergarten through sixth grade um, reading levels. So I would encourage you to, to keep this in mind and jump in there because you can probably save yourself some frustration. If you want to make sure that all of your kids are getting the strong sound symbol decoding basis and that, that you see those words start to stick and stuff doesn't slip by, then I think the Reading Simplified Academy will be a good spot for you to discover those secrets. So I'm going to check to see if there's any questions and then um, say adieu. Any questions or last minute comments? Uh, if you're finding this after the fact, go ahead and put the comments in the post and maybe tag a friend or maybe share it out to your friends. If this is information that would help your friends with the sight word problem that they're dealing with, I think that they would be pleased for you to share that with them. But again, if you have questions um, later on, I'll still be checking this feed to um, help and, you know, dialogue about this. Is, um, I'm very passionate about this. And thanks for tuning in today to Reading Simplified. And I uh, look forward to seeing you next Tuesday, maybe tomorrow too with a, with a uh, first grader, but also for sure next Tuesday at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern. Sorry for getting the wrong time if you noticed that in my email. Okay, everybody. Thanks for tuning in and good night.